Okay, my guest today is Stephen C. Meyer, the famous uh, intelligent design theorist. His book is Return of the God Hypothesis, Three Scientific Discoveries that Reveal the Mind Behind the Universe. Stephen received his PhD from the University of Cambridge in the Philosophy of Science. He directs the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute in Seattle and authored the New York Times bestseller Darwin's Doubt and Signature in the Cell. And this is sort of the third volume of his trilogy in, in uh, building his arguments uh, for there being an intelligent mind behind the cosmos. I'm skeptical. And so he and I go back and forth on at least a dozen different major issues in which I push back on all of them. And he has, of course, rebuttals because there's nothing he hasn't heard from any of us. Um, and uh, so to that extent, uh, it's a phenomenal conversation uh, talk about everything, physics and biology and consciousness, morality, why there's something rather than nothing, and, in, and information theory, and the laws of uh, physics, and the mathematical universe, and, and on and on and on. It, it's a phenomenal conversation on the biggest questions of all, and the ultimate one, is there uh, something behind it all, something like a god, or an intelligent designer, a mind? Um, well, to find out the answer, give this a listen. Thanks for listening. All right, Stephen Meyer, here it is. The Return of the God Hypothesis. Three scientific discoveries that reveal the mind behind the universe. Well, all right. Um, you know, you and I have done debates over the years many times, and uh, we're not going to do that today. Let's just have a conversation. Let's just talk about, you know, the, like big, a lot of fun, the, the big questions yeah. and um, the problem with debate, and I'm tending probably never going to do them again because you know it's, you, people are just trying to win, and it's more tribal and it becomes more political in that sense, and and I find that not so useful. So let's just see what kind of headway we can make. Uh, we can just leave off the table. You're trying to convert me, or I'm trying to convert you. We're not even going to do that. We're just going to talk about uh, the big issues. <laughs> our, our, our our mutual friend Brian Keating told me you were you wished I were. It would would go secular. So, but oh well. we'll, we'll, we'll uh, there, there's you know, always so a... we both probably both feel the same way. We wish everyone had our worldview. But what I what I uh, I've, I've had some really nice debates with you and with uh, Michael Ruse. And uh, one thing that I have felt is that uh, anyone who takes these big questions seriously uh, is is a friend, and that there's this kind of kinship between people who are interested in these things. And, um, I read an article over the weekend by someone who said that. The great thing about the new atheists, and this was a, a, a young Christian writer, was that they actually took a, they actually took religion seriously enough to, uh, <laughs> to to make an argument about it. You know, and, yeah, that's uh, right. So, well, we should take religion uh, so that, seriously. I mean, we, it's have an, that, we have that in common. It's an important yeah. institution, and so on. Well, before we get into it, just for my listeners that don't know much about you, give us a little bit of a pot of, uh, autobiography of of uh, you know where you grew up and your education and where you work now and what. Yeah, and, and, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm from the Seattle area originally. I went to uh, uh, university uh, as an undergrad at uh, Whitworth University in uh, eastern Washington, it's a small liberal arts uh, college uh, affiliated with a Presbyterian uh, tradition. Um, I uh, majored in geology and physics and uh, took a minor in philosophy on the side. After graduation, I worked for four years in the oil industry. I was doing seismic digital processing for a big uh, oil company in Texas. Um, and I got a Rotary scholarship uh, my last year to head off to England and did a first a master's in the history of science and then a PhD in the philosophy of science at Cambridge. My PhD dissertation and study was uh, in the field of origin of life biology. So it was a very interdisciplinary um, topic. And um, after I got out, I went, came back to Whitworth and taught there for a number of years in 96, four or six years into my tenure. I helped start the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute in 2002, came full-time, resigned my position at, at Whitworth and came full-time to work with Discovery. Uh, since which time I've been uh, engaging folks like Michael Shermer and uh, Michael Ruse and uh, writing books and articles and uh, uh, had, a, had a role in the, in the formation of the Intelligent Design Research Program. Yeah, I should say, uh, point out to my listeners, and, and you met, you mentioned this in your book, that um, not all scientists take your hypothesis, your, not just yours, but the other intelligent design theorists, very seriously. I think in part, uh, particularly with older scientists, they're, they're remembering 
uh, young earth creationists of the 1950s and 60s, people like Dwayne Gish and Henry Morris and and the Gish Gallup and all that stuff, and, and none of that panned out at all as is is even hardly useful to even look at. This is not your father's creationism. I should tell people that <laughs> this is far more serious. This you know these are not just published by uh, Christian publishers. Your book is Harper Collins. I mean, and 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 same thing with many of your colleagues. These are mainstream trade or university presses that are publishing your works. And uh, you know, I have a shelf full of books um, by professional philosophers and scientists addressing your claim. So. Um, you know, you are getting a hearing. It's being taken seriously. And, and again, this is not your father's creationism. So it's worth discussing. And, and as well, you know, I've had conversations on the kind of sociology of, of science and knowledge in general. And, you know, there's kind of a split in, in the atheist skeptical community about um, about belief in God and, and religion. And, you know, Dan Dennett's argument. Well, I you know, of course, I'm an atheist, but I believe in belief. I believe that other people need to believe or want to believe. And that may be true for some people, but I, I suspect not for, for you. Um, you're not claiming this is my truth and you have your truth or, you know, Noma, you know, you have your world and we have our world. You're, you're making an argument that's empirical, that's a scientific-based argument, that it's really true, not, not just mythically true or psychologically true. Right, right. True for me, true for you, true. Yeah. Um, or, or Freudian in the sense that uh, man did not create God, but God uh, uh, God did not create man, but man created the concept of God. I'm I'm arguing for more than the concept of God, although the concept of God functions as as uh, an explanatory hypothesis, and I argue that because it does provide such uh, uh, compelling ex- explanation of of key facts we have about biological, physical, and cosmological origins, we have good reason. To believe that the concept is also referring to a reality. In the same way, when we, as in, in theoretical physics, where we posit an unobservable in order to explain something we can observe, when we find that that unobservable entity, whether a quark or a force or a field, provides the best explanation of the observables, we hold that um, uh, that postulation as uh, as a as a truth pointer. It's pointed to something that's a reality. So when we think about how science works, since you, you, you're you positing a scientific hypothesis to be tested in a way, that, that testing, that falsification, that Popperian falsification is part of it, but not the only part of it. Uh, there's also kind of a Bayesian, you know, moving in the direction of positive evidence that we can accumulate in which our confidence grows or shrinks, depending on uh, on changing our priors as the new evidence comes in and so forth. But there's also then a social aspect that I, uh, I like uh, to think about is uh, the kind of consensus science. You know, has science reached a consensus or not? So like when I started college in 1971, the, the Big Bang Theory had largely uh, ousted the steady state theory. There was a lot of consensus from most scientists in labs, from you know, cumulative independent lines of uh, evidence to point to that and not the other one. And so the Big Bang Theory kind of won out and and... And almost nobody, I presume nobody, could probably find somebody that embraces steady state theory today. But nevertheless, there's consensus on that. Now, if you are... Oil held on to it to the bit, to the bitter end, but uh, even gold and Bondi uh, <laughs> relinquished that uh, fairly quickly. Yeah, his, co- his co- co-formulators of the theory, yeah. So if the accumulated evidence you present in your book along these three major lines of, of inquiry... Uh, were true, or that you know, it's, it's it's substantial evidence. Wouldn't most scientists who work in these areas read your book and go, "Yes, th- I think that's probably correct." And I don't see that happening. Uh, I mean, your book just came out, so maybe that's not fair for your book. But but the arguments that you guys have been making since the '90s have been around. So I just take Brian Keating's podcast. He read your book. Uh, he knows all the cosmology that that you present in there. He understands it. And so I, when I had him on my podcast, I asked him, so are, did you convert? <laughs> are, you a, are you a theist now? And to be fair, Brian's not an, he's not an atheist like in the Doc, Dawkins mode. He's not militant about it at all. You know, he's not, not something he's trying to do. So, you know, here's what he said, roughly speaking here, without my playing it. I'm using the YouTube transcript. You know, as uh, I read this as a cosmologist, and I find uh, oftentimes, like with William Lane Craig in particular, that it's sort of this... It borders on the confirmation bias. It borders on manipulation of evidence to support a conclusion, and that conclusion always ignores the existence of alternative cosmologies, of which there are many. 
And in this article for the cover issue of Skeptic, so this article he did for us, I want to flesh out the fact that it is by no means settled that there was a Big Bang. Now listen, I said a Big Bang because it seems to me that if there were multiple Big Bangs, that doesn't give more support for a creator than it might give less support for a creator. Anyway, and he goes off on there. And so, for example, in this article, he talks about inflationary cosmology and the different versions of that. And then this bouncing cyclical models that look something like that. (laughs) Uh, And, uh, you know, he talks about these kind of multiple Big Bangs. And he says, I'll just read this portion. Um, So there's this one conformal cyclical cosmological model claims the universe endlessly cycles through consecutive eons of time in which, as Roger Penrose described it, the distant future of a particular eon becomes identified with the Big Bang of the subsequent eon. In so-called bouncing models, the cosmos rebounds after a contracting phase, ushering in a new expansion. According to Stein, Hart, and Turok, this cycle iterates on trillion-year time cycles, time scales. So, at the very whether that turns out to be true or not, who knows? But, but the point is that we don't know enough to know that your alternative explanation is the is the one we should take. Maybe we just don't know, and there's these other alternatives. Yeah, well, I've got a lot to say about that. It's a great question. Um, first of all, um, there may be confirmation bias in the scientific community that would uh, prevent a majority consensus congealing around something as um, as provocative as I'm proposing. Uh, we do know that there is a default rule of method known as methodological naturalism that uh, says that if you're going to be a, scienti- a scientist, you have to explain everything by reference to purely materialistic causes, whether you're talking about uh, e- even including things like the origin of the universe, the origin of life, the, its fine-tuning, or the origin and nature of human consciousness. Um, and so if that's taken as normative, then no amount of evidence uh, for creative intelligence could move uh, a group of people who already hold that as normative. That's one thing to say. Second thing to say is I don't I don't accept the premise of the question that uh, these evidences and uh, are not moving professionals who are working in the in the fields uh, in which I'm talking. Uh, I, I've got, um, you know, I've got some fantastic book endorsements, including from a Nobel laureate in physics um, and, and from leading scientists. But also going back to the the, the, uh, the 1980s, um, you had books like uh, God and the Astronomers by Robert Jastrow. You had the very uh, dramatic uh, public uh, conversion of Alan Sandage, who cited evidences from cosmology as a factor in his in his intellectual conversion from materialism to theism, and so I don't think we can make an argument one way or another uh, from the sociology of science alone. Uh, there would be reason there would there could be confirmation bias within the f- within the field, and there are there are plenty of people who have gone the opposite direction of of that that you indicate. Uh, as to Brian, he's an interesting guy. Um, he is. He describes himself as an agnostic who wrestles with God, but he clearly is a theist. He's a practicing uh, conservadox uh, <laughs> Jewish fellow, mm-hmm. and um, and he's told me maybe I don't know what he's told you, but he's told me that he he finds the argument from design and biology quite quite persuasive. So um, you know, but not cosmology. May, so well, interesting. But let's talk about the cosmology because what I argue is that the evidence has theistic implications. Obviously, there are new models being proposed all the time, but the, uh, the I, and I address the, the the cyclical and and oscillating models in the um, in cosmology head on. Um, there's very powerful work critiquing those models, going back to the wor- going back to Alan Guth, who showed that with each successive cycle in an oscillating universe, you have an accumulation of entropy. You have to because there's energy blowing the universe apart. Uh, and so to get it, the, the next cycle has an, uh, less energy available to do work. You've got an entropy buildup. And therefore, if you'd had an infinite number of cycles, you're, eventually you're going to damp out like a bouncing, a bouncing ball. And if the universe was infinitely old, we would have reached that state of nullifying equilibrium a long time ago. Ergo, the universe couldn't be infinitely old. Ergo, even on a an oscillating universe model, you have a beginning. Now, the newer uh, cyclical models have been proposed by Steinhardt and, and uh, Penrose um, uh, are posit some mechanism of with each cycle of uh, reducing entropy of going back to a highly ordered state. But the mechanisms have no specificity, and they're contrary to everything we know about physics in our universe. And this is where you know, just uh, in our discussions, I love 
the whole, you know, skeptic magazine. And I know Brian's got a piece expressing skepticism about the uh, the multiverse. But I uh, there is a form of naturalism now, which I call in the book exotic naturalism. It's a form of supernatural materialism where things are posited beyond this universe in order to explain the key features we have about the key indicators we have of a beginning to this universe, as well as the fine tuning of the universe, as well as the, the, the deep mystery of the origin of life. And I think there's a tremendous basis for skepticism about this, these exotic forms of naturalism, where we're talking about, whether we're talking about multiverses in the, in the sense uh, that, that are invoked to explain the fine tuning, or whether we're talking about an infinite cycle of previous universes to which we have no empirical access by definition, or whether we're talking about Hawking's notion of imaginary time, or, um, or you know, even folks positing space alien designers to try to, pos to explain the the evident evidence for design and the the digital informational properties of, of living systems. I mean, no less a personage than Francis Crick posited pan panspermia with a with a design coming from some imminent intelligence within the cosmos because he recognized the extreme difficulty of explaining the origin of life within this cosmos. Um, Kunin has posited the multiverse as an explanation for the origin of the first life. So I think there's a, you know, you've, you've made your bread and butter as a skeptic and, and, and rightly so. Many of the things you're skeptical about, I'm skeptical about, but I'm suggesting that, that there is an appropriate skepticism about these extremely and increasingly convoluted uh, materialistic models that are invoking things beyond this universe, beyond, beyond any possible observational confirmation as explanations for for the, the key features that I'm addressing in the book. So I'm not skeptical about modern cosmology. I think the facts, every indicator we have in cosmology points to a beginning. Of course, we can create imaginative scenarios of multiple cycles before this one or other, other verses out there, multiverses, billions of them. But I think it's reasonable to be skeptical about them and to weigh whether they really provide a better explanation than the single uh, uh, and more simple postulate in the Occam's razor sense of a transcendent intelligence. Yeah, I want to uh, dig down into that methodological naturalism, but I, I had one more example. Uh, since you said Brian said yeah, Brian was uh, encouraged by the biological arguments for intelligent design, but that's not his field. So I, I found a review of your book on BioLogos. I know you know those guys. And uh, here I'm, 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 I'm reminded of Christopher Hitchens' line about if you hear the Pope say he believes in God, uh, today you think, well, the Pope's doing his job. That's what he's supposed to do. But if you hear the if you hear that the Pope says he's having some doubts about God today, you think, whoa, maybe I should pay attention here. Uh, so you know, I mean, BioLogos, the you know sort of theistic evolutionists or or creative evolution, whatever they call themselves now, you would expect them. Whatever they call them, like keep shifting the, uh, the terminology. You would, you would yeah, think you okay. would. I just, you did, would get I just a, did a long podcast with their oh, guy Jim Stump. So oh, you I'm, did. Oh, okay. Yeah interacting with all the different points on the ideological compass here. Well, then then you can respond to this. I'm sure you've seen this review by Daryl Falk. I don't know yeah, him. Sure. He's a biologist. Yeah. Uh, he says, Mayer's critique of the origin of life and evolutionary biology has significant inaccuracies. For example, discussing the hypothetical RNA world and the origin of life, Meyer writes, quote, to date, scientists have been able to design RNA catalysts that will copy only about 10% of themselves, close quote. He then references a paper from 2001. However, the field has progressed quite well in the past 20 years. For example, in 2014, Robertson and Joyce reported a similar system with a tweak which resulted in 100% effectiveness. They summarize the results with these words, quote, each parental enzyme can give rise to thousands of copies per hour, and each of these copies in turn can do the same, all the while transmitting molecular information across uh, generations. And then he has a discussion about enzy enzymic, en en enzymatic reactions uh, and so on. And then he, go he says Meyer goes on to describe a meeting at the New Trends in Evolutionary Biology, which he attended 2016, and this guy was there too. Um, I was at the meeting also. In one sense, I think he's right. The theme of the meeting was that classic gene-based studies of how evolution works were given, giving a far too narrow picture of how the process of evolution has taken place. There's simply much more to the story than that, which emerges when the focus is on genes. A more holistic approach is required. Uh, Meyer summarized the opening talk this way, and quoting you now. In short, neo-Darwinism fails. Hey, hey to, Michael, would it, yeah. be, would it be okay to take these things separately? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Two big subjects. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you know, go ahead. The yeah. RNA do, thing. Do and the then first the, one. Yeah. The, the uh, developmental biology issues. Um, 
I, I addressed the, the Joyce paper in a response to my book that was uh, published in the Times Literary Supplement. Uh, in, uh, and basically what they did was they, they had two pre-made halves, which they fused together. Okay. And so this was not a significant increase in biological information. And there was a huge amount of, the, 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 to the extent that they got any replicatory or biological relevance out of their RNA world simulation, there was an incredible input of, or a significant input of information from the investigator. You have to, the investigator has to sequence the bases in the RNA to get any any rem, uh, resemblance of function out of it. So these these experiments are not simulating undirected evolutionary change. And uh, uh, Jim Tour, who knows a whole lot more about organic synthesis than than Daryl Falk, has been stripping the bark off of these guys in Origin of Life research, pointing out that they're starting with purified reagents. They're they're implementing an intelligently designed recipe where they combine specific chemicals at particular temperatures, cool them at just the right time, uh, remove the, in, inter, the the byproducts so that they don't we don't get interfering cross reactions. This field really has made no progress apart from simulations that involve extensive investigator interference, where the investigator is inputting information. So uh, I'll, I'll stand very firmly by my original critique of RNA world and people who know a lot more about organic chemistry than Daryl Falk uh, are, are pointing out the very same problems that I am. Falk, by the way, in his review of Darwin's doubt, acknowledged, and this gets to your question about methodological, methodological naturalism. He said that, that I was absolutely correct that mutation and selection did not have the creative power to generate the new information needed for something like the Cambrian explosion, and that the newer uh, post-neo-Darwinian models, which I also critiqued in that book, were also inadequate to the task. His reason for holding on to a general evolutionary framework was his aff affirmation of methodological naturalism. So the biologist wasn't critiquing the biology in that case. He was he was he had a he had a confirmation bias, a pre-commitment to methodological naturalism. Now you may now, now go on with the yeah yeah no the, fair, uh, fair enough. Interrupt. Just, no, no, it's too okay. many things to keep in my head at one time. Yeah yeah the, uh, fair, fair the enough. London meeting. Uh, and yeah, again, yeah. the only reason I'm reading this is because based evolution. This guy, you know, premises his review of your book saying, "I'm a born again evangelical Christian. I accept Jesus. I do believe uh, God operates in the world and miracles and so on." Right, but we've, yeah. we've been having a pretty good fight with those guys too, because you know mm. what they do is they simply baptize a standard evolutionary theory and say that it's some way that it's very easy to reconcile with with theism. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I, that doesn't absolve them of the need to address the scientific problems with those theories. And uh, as you and I have talked before, I think it's appropriate to be skeptical about neo-Darwinism, and many leading evolutionary biologists are. It was striking to me at that meeting that um, there, that you know, that people were very explicit about the lack of creative power associated with the mutation selection mechanism, and they were there to investigate other possible evolutionary mechanisms that could possibly that, that could possibly supplement that creative power. Susan Mazur, who's been part of the Altenberg 16 group and who was one of the, the voices calling for the meeting, characterized the meeting as a whole afterwards for its lack of momentousness, that it, it did effectively a good job of explaining the problems, but there weren't really powerful solutions on offer. And Falk's characterization of this is just a matter of gene-based evolution, that my critique was only about gene-based evolution is really, um, a, a misrepresentation of what I argued. I argued, yes, it's absolutely uh, the, the, the rarity of genes and proteins in combinatorial sequence space is uh, is a huge problem for generating not my, minor modifications to existing genes or proteins, but generating new protein folds. That's one level of the critique I offered. But at a higher level, um, I looked at the whole problem of the, the, of the immutability of Gene regulatory networks, which is the the locus of uh, uh, Davidson's work at Caltech for years. I looked at the importance of in body plant formation of epigenetic and ontogenetic information. These new discoveries about these hierarchies of informational control in life are posing problems for uh, ev evolutionary developmental biology at every level. It's not just a matter of generating new genes and proteins. So I don't accept the, his characterization of the narrowness of my critique. Hmm, interesting. But the media itself was not proposing what your hypothesis is one of the alternatives no, on the of course, table. But, yeah. but I, you know, I happen to know about about 10, 10 to fifteen percent of the people there were uh, were ID people. I mean, we were obviously interested in what was being discussed. You know, people like, for example, Gunter Beckley, the the, uh, the German paleontologist, who has announced his 
support for intelligent design uh, coming from a deep background in evolutionary biology and paleontology. I guess my my point in this thread is I, I do wonder, will we ever get to a consensus? Maybe it's 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Or will we never reach consensus science because it has metaphysical, even religious overtones, and people just sure. can't make sure. that, yeah. that leap? I mean, are we forever going to... This well, is going to be a different think, question than just yeah. say Big Bang versus steady state. This is a different kind of animal. Yeah, and, and that's kind of why I wrote the book and why I think conversations like the, you, the ones that you and I have had over the years are so important because uh, we may not reach consensus, but uh, as I think you know, you're arguing in your n- new book, uh, we still should be talking to each other. <laughs> there needs to be free speech in this country and and having these constructive dialogues where we're not stigmatizing each other and stereotyping each other and all that. And uh, uh, these are the most interesting questions. You know, there was a conference at Baylor 20 years ago called The Nature of Nature. Yeah, I was there. And it was raising the question. Yeah, you were there. I think that may have been the first time we met, actually, because uh, I think we did our first debate a year or two later at that uh, uh, college in Wisconsin. But uh, these are fantastically interesting questions, and we don't need to be afraid of them. You know, some some people come down, nature is a self existing self-organizing system. It does not require something external to itself to explain its properties. That's the that's the naturalistic view of you, of, of Sean Carroll and you and and you know some of the, the aggressive new atheists and I know you're not part of that uh, group, but uh, fair enough. You know that's a, that's a viewpoint. That's an interesting viewpoint. The other view is that nature has properties that are pointing to something beyond itself and requires something external to itself in order to explain what we see. And I find, and that's generally a theistic view, but one of the point, things that I was pointing out in the book is there is a kind of uh, uh, materialistic supernaturalism now. I called it exotic naturalism, where things pos- that, where scientists are feeling the need to posit things beyond our universe in order to explain the properties of the universe, even if they're not willing to consider creative intelligence as a possibility. So we get multiverses and we get quantum wave functions and we get you know, a cyclical, uh, you know, um, cyclical ci- cycles of expansion and contraction before the Big Bang. Um, but, you know, these questions of, of ultimate causal origins raise these deeper metaphysical questions. And I think we can have constructive conversations about them. We can evaluate them rationally. One thing I appreciate about Dawkins is he has a great talent for framing issues. And he has this wonderful quote where he says that the universe has exactly the properties we should expect if at bottom there's no purpose, no design, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Well, of course, blind, pitiless indifference is shorthand for strictly materialistic processes. So he's saying materialism as an overarching system of thought can be tested by looking at the properties that the universe has. I agree with that. I think metaphysical hypotheses are testable more in a Bayesian way than in the way we do in the lab where you put something under... Uh, put you know do something under controlled laboratory conditions and try to get replicability, um, but but um, so I I appreciate Dawkins is willing to engage a big metaphysical question and say we can we can evaluate test it by observations we make of the properties of the universe. I just happen to disagree with Dawkins's ultimate conclusion, and, and I think that there are key properties of the universe that are much more expected on theism than on than on naturalism and. Three that I mention and develop in the book are that the universe, as best we can tell from the empirical evidence, had a beginning, that the universe has been finely tuned for the possibility of life from the beginning and soon thereafter, and that at the foundation of life, we have an integrated informational complexity, digital code, complex information processing, storage, transmission system that that uh, that uh, boggles the mind and, and points in every way to a designing intelligence, a master programmer for life. So I think those are three things that you would not have expected on a straightforward naturalistic worldview. You wouldn't have expected a beginning, you wouldn't have expected fine tuning, and you wouldn't have expected digital code at the foundation of life. And one way we know that's not what you would expect is is the the number of explanatory postulates, pure pure theoretical postulates that have to be formulated on, to save the appearances from a naturalistic point of view. The multiverse is a great example of that. That naturalism has become more and more convoluted in the sense of epicycles of explanatory entities in order to explain the same things that that a, a single common sense appeal to intelligent design or creative intelligence would explain. 
Yeah, I was um, surprised you didn't have a fourth um, line of, of inquiry that is the moral law within. You know, Immanuel Kant's famous line about the two great mysteries of the world are the starry heavens above and the moral law within. Is that your next book, or did I think you just great not have enough space for that? From, from, yeah, yeah no, I, I think there's a great—I used to teach that argument. I have a, I have a, a Steve Meyer version of it, if you will, but I, th I think that that values, uh, valuing is something that only persons can do. I'll give you my version of the moral argument. I used to do this in Intro to Philosophy. Uh, valuing is something that only persons can do. That's a, uh, that's a, uh, and uh, all ethical systems are based on underlying values. For example, the intrinsic value of human life. Um, if all, if, if there isn't an objective valuer, a single person who's uh, whose whose opinion about what is most important counts most, then we will necessarily get multiple systems of valuing and therefore multiple systems of ethics, and therefore we will devolve into relativism. But none of us actually live as though all ethics are are uh, are, are purely relative. That that ethical propositions are only applicable to individual persons or groups. We uh, all in our behavior reveal that we accept an objective ethical system when it's our ox that's being gored or our mother who's being kicked in the shins or um, our child is being abused. Um, therefore, we're, we act as though there is an objective ethical system. Theism, insofar as it provides uh, or it posits a single uh, ethical opinion that matters more than any other because theism posits a designer who made the ethical system to encourage human flourishing provides the best grounding for something that we all tacitly end up revealing that we that we believe in, which is an objective moral uh, moral proposition. Yeah, that's interesting because I'm a moral objectivist and realist as well, e even though I'm an atheist. And I think you can derive it, although yeah, how, most... How does that work? Yeah, I'm interested. How does that work for you, Michael? I mean, what's well, your grounding? Well, <laughs> that's kind of a, yeah. another long... That was my podcast episode this last oh, week. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, with two, two theistic philosophers. I didn't even know they were... Theistic James Hunter and uh, uh, Nedaleski. His their book was. Um, sorry, let me just get that straight for my. Uh, oh yeah, I know. He's the sociologist of religion at uh, Virginia, right? Yes, uh, correct. Hunter? Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah, that that's right. Let me uh, give you the title of their book here. Sorry. Uh, yeah, this is this week's uh, James Hunter and Paul Nedaleski. Right. So their book is Science and the Good: The Tragic Quest for the Foundations of Morality. To their credit, as I told them. Uh, halfway through our podcast, when I found out they were theists, I had no idea they were theists. I mean, I read their entire book because I was asked to review it because uh, uh, they critique me and Steve Pinker and Sam Harris and others. Uh, and so to their credit, they made all the arguments without uh, e e ever invoking religion or God or anything like that. Um, so uh, anyway, so I gave them a... So they were reasonable guys in spite of their uh, <laughs> disruptive <laughs> That's right. Bullying. That's right. Now that I know you're a theist, okay, now we're going to take the gloves off. No, just kidding. Now we're going to uh, really... Put this well, you know, I out. agree that it that takes persons in the sense that, like all the primate research that uh, Franz Duvall does, you know, primate politics, and they have these kind of pre-moral sentiments, but, but that's different than the kind of values you're talking about. Uh, I, I think humans are special in that sense. It probably takes uh, some kind of abstract reasoning, maybe even language, uh, to to scale up from these kind of pre-moral sentiments that primates have, or maybe all mammals, uh, and uh, and and then you go from there. I did. I, I was glad you quoted Dawkins. Let me just read that again. The universe we observe has yeah, yeah, go ahead. the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom. No design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Well, I listened to the reading of your book, and, and I, I noticed it kept coming up over and over and over, and I have a PDF, so I just did a scan of the word pitiless indifference, blind, pitiless indifference. Thirteen times you quoted this. So I gather this it's is a important. money quote, my friend, it, <laughs> it, because he does such a beautiful job of framing the yeah. issue, you know. But you see, is it or is it not the case? That the that the properties of the universe are what we'd expect on naturalism or materialism, or are the properties what we'd expect on theism? And I think it I it, think, it but, suggests but what the I'm asking is that metaphysical hypotheses. That last part. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. That last part. There's no good yeah. or evil. It's just pitiless indifference. I, I my sense is that's what really bothers you, as it would anybody. Uh, no, what uh, I'm interested in the metaphysical question itself. 
Um, I mean, I, I'm not one of these people that's a theist because um, if there were, were no God that my fragile psyche couldn't take it. I, I you know, I, I cite Lawrence Krauss at the end. He says the universe uh, doesn't owe us comfort. And so I, I want to know it's true. And what I appreciate about you know, a number of the new atheists is they took religion seriously enough to say, is it true or not? I think there are a lot of people in the pews that actually don't really believe very much of it. And um, and uh, I think the starting point is to determine, well, is there or is there not uh, a God? I mean, that's a very important question. Or is is materialism true? Is it Are matter and energy the eternal self-existent entities from which everything else came, the ontological ground of all being, as the philosophers would put it, or the prime reality? Or is it a personal agent? Um, that's been something we've debated in Western philosophy since the Greeks. And I thought, let's 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 you know let's let's get it on, you know, and 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 weigh the arguments on both sides. And 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 his way of framing it also dovetails to this whole Bayesian uh, abductive approach to evaluating propositions, which I I thought was really helpful. Where I depart, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. When I depart from from Dawkins and maybe Ed Wilson as well on this. Ed made the distinction between empiricists and transcendentalists. Transcend, not the transcendentalists, but something different. That is, is it just what we see, materialist, or can we transcend something? Uh, to me, it's transcendent to think that we are born with a nature that has a sense of right and wrong and guilt and shame. That comes with the species. It's not uh, subjective just to me or my family, my group, my tribe, my nation, Western culture, whatever. There are certain values that are really mm -hmm. objectively wrong. And, you know, so I start with Lincoln. If slavery is not wrong, nothing's wrong. And, well, how do you know it's wrong, you know, outside of, you know, Lincoln and Western culture or whatever? Well, because you just ask the slave, you know, would you rather be free or would you rather be enslaved? Would you rather be, you know, satiated or would you rather be hungry? Would you rather be in pain or would you rather be out of pain? And so on. You can just kind of go through these basics of life and, you know, people vote with their feet. <laughs> literally, uh, or their dollars, or they vote with their behaviors, what they want. And so we can make, you know, general conclusions about what's objectively right and wrong from there. And and to me, I can, I, I in my other work, I try to scale up from Dawkins' selfish gene model to, you know, this kind of reciprocal altruism, kin selection, reciprocal altruism, and so on, that, you know, as Dawkins says in the self, selfish gene, that the difference between, uh, let's say, a rock and a lump of food a lump of food is an animal, and and the the rock won't kick back if I kick it, but the animal will. So, uh, and I know that the animal knows that it doesn't want to be in pain. So I have to, you know, act in a different way than I would with a stone. And if it's another human, I know that he knows that I know I'm selfish, and I know that he knows that I know that he knows <laughs> that he's yeah. selfish, and so on. So we have to, you know, act in a in a moral way. Now, one more step. It's not enough to fake being a good person, a moral person, a caring person, because we give off tells. You know, uh, Bob Trivers talked about self-deception. You know, cult leaders or whatever, they, they believe their own lies because they're better at able to, to pitch what they're selling. But we have lie detection uh, circuitry that looks for cues, like this person's bullshitting me or exaggerating or lying. And so there's this kind of arms race, evolutionary arms race, between lying and lying detection. And so it's not enough to say I'm, I'm a good person or I'm a moral person. You actually have to act it. And even there, you could give off subconscious cues or tells that you're faking it. So you actually have to believe it. Like, I really actually care about you. Not just pretending in a, in a Machiavellian, manipulative, dark triad, narcissistic way. I actually do believe it and uh, and feel it. And that's to me, that's genuine morality. It's as good as anything that is on offer from theists as I see it, because you guys have the problem of, of, of the euthyphro problem. You know, if God handed us these moral values, you know, how do, first of all, how do we know what they are? Well, we get them out of holy books. Well, you know, they, those holy books conflict with each other. But in any case, does God in, endorse moral values that are objectively right and wrong? And, and, and if so, why can't we just go straight to the source? And why do we have to, you know, read it in a book or whatever? Can we discern it some way? Or is it only what he says is right and wrong? You know the problem, of course. So uh, anyway, to me, I think we can sure. derive those. I'm, I'm way down a sidetrack because I just said, why don't you have four of them? Maybe that's your next book. <laughs> uh, 
um, and that will do another. Well, yeah, and we should stipulate that I, I don't really address the moral argument. I do make a, an epistemological argument. I think theism uniquely grounds belief in the reliability of the mind, and I discussed that in the very last chapter of the book. And I think theistic pre presuppositions about the intelligibility of nature and the reliability of the mind were crucial to the rise of modern science during the period we call the scientific revolution. But on the on the moral argument, just to, uh, um, I mean, that that's, I, I've never heard you unpack your take on it that before. That's really interesting. My take on it is that um, the evolutionary account of uh, that it's entirely possible to discern uh, ethical uh, principles, what we should do, but they all presuppose an underlying value that uh, to the individual that's difficult to account for on an evolutionary and materialistic uh, worldview. And secondly, that that. Uh, if we give an evolutionary account of the origin of moral motions or or in, intuitions or principles, uh, um, I don't think that the evolutionary account ex uh, uh, withstands its own exposure. As soon as I know that what I regard as moral, inviolate moral principles are just something that were programmed into me in order to enhance either my survival or the survival of the, the, the group that I'm part of, uh, I don't really have a reason to continue to obey them if the moral principles cut against my survival, uh, my survival interests in the moment. So um, anyway, it's a big discussion, but I'm glad we should continue. I think I'm relieved to know you're a moral objectivist. I think that explains why you and I have some very similar uh, uh, political views about free speech and libertarian, uh, you know, the importance of, of liberty and things like that. So anyway, well, but you, see, you can that, come back at it. I, that, I just, that in itself would be a fu fundamental you got to start somewhere. So I start with this kind of fundamental autonomy and freedom that it's my body and my choices and so on. But I know you have yours as well. So for me to appeal to you using reason and rational arguments for why you should be nice to me, I have to take you seriously and show you that I should be nice to you. And this is kind of a foundation of, of, of moral exchange. Yeah, I moral think you values. can get to some specific agreed moral principles in, in that sort of in a personal negotiation, accounting for the difference between is and ought, when oughts are expression of underlying values, and we want our ought statements to be universal, suggests the need for a universal source of those, the, the values that underline the oughts. So a universal person rather than your, ver, your opinion versus mine. It is really interesting in that Dawkins quote that we were bandying back and forth, that he says there's no evil, no good. His His version of materialism does does lead to a form of relativism, and I think you're you're somewhat unusual among uh, people with a, a, a naturalistic worldview in affirming moral objectivity. Uh, there was a famous I am unusual uh, that, that, Kai that way. Wilson who did as well. Yeah, yeah I am. That, that, I am unusual that way. Although I'm not the only one, Pinker and, and Sam yeah. Harris as well. Uh, but Robert Pennock uh, yeah. makes makes the argument because I sent him all my stuff and said, "What do you think?" Because I'm not a philosopher and I don't even play one on TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and he said, "Well, you're re you know this." starting with the survival and flourishing of yourself and, you know, the human condition uh, and the betterment of, uh, of survival and flourishing for others and so forth. That in itself, as a foundation point, has an ought built into it. You, you, you can, he, he convinced me that you cannot truly derive an ought from just is, is that, that one of the premises probably has an ought built into it, which was Hume's original point. So I take him. I take him to be correct on that. And so what? Okay. So you know, again, just ask the slave. Would you rather be enslaved or free? He's going to say, I want to be free. Okay. Well, how do we know? Well, because he just said so. All right. So I mean, the the person is expressing their their desire, and that's it. okay. That's a slight. But I, but but a second point on Dawkins' quote because here I think um, we're making an error that I call Alvey's error. That is assessing the purpose of something at the wrong level of, of analysis. Alvy is Alvy Singer, uh, Woody, Al Woody Allen's character in Annie Hall, where recall in the movie he has that flashback to childhood where he uh, is no longer doing his homework and his mother takes him to the psychiatrist. And Alvy, why won't you do your homework? He says, because the universe is expanding. <laughs> and he says, what? He says, well, the universe <laughs> is expanding and someday it's going to all blow up. So it doesn't make any difference whether I do my homework or not. And his mother upbraids him and says, what's the universe got to do with it? We live in Brooklyn and Brooklyn's not expanding. <laughs> and, uh, and I use this, That's this is one of my, gallon. yeah, this is one of my scientific American columns. Cause I was responding one, to one of William Lane Craig's uh, debates that I watched with him and Shelley Kagan 
uh, about uh, that, well, as he said here, on a naturalistic worldview, everything is ultimately destined to destruction and the heat death of the universe. As the universe expands, it grows colder and colder and heats up, and, you know, then, then nothing means anything. So Kagan responded to that. Oh, because Craig had brought up that, you know, godless not Nazi torturers, they got away with it. So it didn't matter. And so, and Kagan is, uh, is Jewish, and he's like, this strikes me as an outrageous thing to suggest. It doesn't really matter. Surely it matters to the torture victims, whether they're being tortured. It doesn't require that this makes some cosmic difference to the eternal significance of the universe to, to, for it to matter whether a human being is tortured. It matters to them. It matters to their family, and it matters to us. And then Craig committed a related fallacy when he argued that without God, there are no objective moral values, moral duties, or moral accountability. And if life ends at the grave, then ultimately it makes no difference whether you live as Stalin or as a Mother Teresa. So I call this Craig's categorical error, assessing the value of something by the wrong criteria, uh, category of criteria. So, for example, we live in the here and now, not the hereafter, so our actions must be judged according to the criteria of this category, whether or not the category of a God-granted hereafter exists. Whether you behave like a Russian dictator who murdered tens of millions of people or a Russian or a Roman Catholic missionary who tended the poor matters very much to the victims of totalitarianism and poverty. And then why does it matter? Well, because this is in our nature. We don't want to suffer. Well, it matters to the individual person, but the idea of morality, as you point out, is that it is universal and it must be transpersonal. And one of the problems with tyrants is that uh, there was no pro there was no principle that they they acknowledged that applied not only to themselves but to the the, the people they tortured. So. I know this is a deep this is a deep question uh, in moral philosophy, but um, I, I think that the uh, underlying all ethical propositions are uh, beliefs about values, and and I think if you want an objective system of morality that is that transcends individual our individual op opinions about what is valuable, um, there must be a valuer who transcend who who has a claim on on his opinion counting more. And uh, I think if there is a creator who made us all with certain design parameters, uh, then if there's a moral law that is offered to advance human flourishing, then I think the theistic account enables us to have that objective morality and have it, and have it grounded. But you know, there's a, there's a ton more to say about this. We won't settle this one, but it's... Uh, da da Dawkins is interesting um, this way, because he's not... It's, he, it's not an argument I make in the book. So. You no, know, I understand. <laughs> it's okay. But, uh, but one final point on that, yeah. that Dawkins himself is not a moral relativist. You know, as you know, he has no qualms about criticizing Islam and, say, female yeah. genital mutilation as being objectively wrong. This is horrible, and he rants about this. So clearly, even he, with that famous but quote... That, but that implies that female persons are valuable, and that begs a question. The grand says, who is, is it value? Are they valuable only to the female persons who are being mutilated or only to Richard Dawkins? Or are there objective principles above us all to which we can appeal that reflect a, a valuation that does, is not derivative of our subjective opinions? Yeah. Well, I say the and latter. I think theism says, yes, there is. And I, and I can tell you where that comes from. And I think, <laughs> that, you know, the, the, the Harvard uh, law professor Harold Berman said, "Underneath all ethical systems is a, a, an unspoken question, which he said the grand says who question. And uh, if the grand says who is always answered by well me or you, I thou, you know, uh, then we're going to get a lot of different moralities coming out of that. And I think for those of us who accept moral objectivism, um, I th I think." Um, that's a problem, and I think theism solves that problem. I don't think I don't think an evolutionary account of morality does. I think we end up realizing that, um, you know, in in the same way, uh, I think the evolutionary account. Uh, when, once we understand that the, the 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 moral principles or our sense of what's valuable has been programmed into us for survival only, if my survival interests depart from the group, I have no compelling reason to continue to go with the dominant morality of the group. Well, the group will. <laughs> they will isolate you if you don't play nice, <laughs> right? Yeah, but then, you, then you're then you back to nature, red tooth and claw, and that's not really what we mean by morality. I, so, 
This is a good discussion, Mike. We should do this more. We should do one. We should do one of these just it, on but, this but if, topic. If, Maybe if we on, are. If on your take is correct, then why do we need a military and police, and why why do we have a judicial system? People do need to be encouraged to bring out the better angels of their nature and 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 I, sequester I their that. inner demons Houston for has sure. His own answer to that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But um, that's the human nature problem that, that theologians discusses related to our our uh, instinctive rebellion against the Creator. Okay, methodological naturalism. Okay, I, I agree with yes, you. Right. I agree with you that it is it is an assumption built into science. Okay, so as opposed to what? What would Say supernatural methodological supernaturalism looks like philosophy of science that would not limit explanatory hypo would not say that we must limit explanatory hypotheses to postulations that affirm only materialistic entities. In other words, the kind of science that was practiced by Newton, Boyle, and Kepler, who got science going. Um, the methodological naturalism is an artifact of late nineteenth century, uh, largely historical uh, or evolutionary biology. It, I mean, it was it was implicit in the origin of species. And um, uh, Darwin made arguments that presupposed that science must not uh, consider uh, creative intelligence. That's okay if he wants to do that, but I think we need to be explicit about that. And so when we're making, uh, here, here's an example that I sometimes use. If you walk into the, into the uh, British Museum and you look at the Rosetta Stone, and someone says, well, how do you think those, those etchings got there? You know, and uh, you say, well, I think it, was, it, mu it must have been wind and erosion. Uh, well, we know something about the origin of information. It always comes from minds. We've got informational inscriptions in three different languages that have been in, translated back and forth. Uh, people will laugh, and rightly so, because um, our, our conviction, if we applied methodological naturalism in that case, we would be limiting the intellectual freedom of the scientist archaeologist to follow the evidence where it most naturally leads given our knowledge of cause and effect. So um, I think we need to be open to when we're talking about causal origins questions, and you made a good point a minute ago I was going to I was going to amplify that about, about your Woody Allen uh, illustration, the wrong level of analysis. It's really important to keep the context of inquiry in mind in science. There are a whole swath of questions where intelligent design the God hypothesis, um, an evolutionary explanation uh, are not relevant because the, the science isn't dealing with causal origins questions or historical questions about how things got here. Most of science is concerned to describe how nature acts. One part of nature affects another part of nature, how nature acts in a regular way on an ongoing basis. It's not asking a question of the form, what caused something to come into existence? It's asking the, a question of the form, what does nature ordinarily do? And if I say, well, God did it, or intelligent design was responsible, or it evolved that way, I'm not really answered the, I've, I've answered the wrong question. But there is a class of scientific questions that are concerned with causal origins. And if I ask, well, how did the, fine, how did the universe acquire the fine tuning that's necessary to life? Or where did the effectively digital form of information that resides in DNA come from in the first place? Those are questions that might have adequate answers by reference to strictly materialistic causes or uh, or forces, but the, the, they might also the right answer might be that creative intelligence had something to do with the fine tuning. After all, Fred Hoyle, a longtime atheist, um, uh, converted to a proto form of theism on the basis of the fine tuning that some of the fine tuning parameters that he himself discovered and said a common sense interpretation of the evidence we have of fine tuning suggested a super intellect monkey with physics and chemistry so um so i just uh, the argument here is that there is a there is a class of scientific questions that should be open to creative intelligence as a possible explanation if the evidence warrants and so the opposite of rigidly applying methodological naturalism in all categories of scientific endeavor is a more open philosophy of science that allows the context to, to dictate the allowable range of questions and then is open to all such possible explanations that are relevant to the question that's being asked. And that, by the way, was a very productive form of, of inquiry during the period of the scientific revolution. And I would also argue it's becoming productive in our larger network of ID scientists who are using design as a heuristic to generate specific predictions about what you ought to find in living systems and then going out and looking for those uh, design patterns that you might find uh, or that, that might be there if life was in fact designed. And I'll give you a few examples of that. 
Yeah, okay. So the, the archaeologist who uncovers the Rosetta Stone um, infers intelligent mind behind it. But they know that there are intelligent minds. They're called people, and they lived in the past before us. And we can dig around in Greece and find, oh, well, there's their tools and artifacts, and there's some graves, and they're their bones. What would be the equivalent of that for, say, DNA or the fine-tuning of the cosmos? That, that's a really common objection to my argument, Michael, and I just put that one deeply, uh, firmly to rest in uh, signature in the cell in the first place. Let me give you an illustration that gets at the principle. Let's say you're uh, an archaeologist and you're going into some, you discover some caves under the ice pack in, uh, in, in Antarctica. And you go into the caves, you've assumed that no one has ever lived in, on the Antarctic uh, continent. It's been way too cold for way too long. But you go in and you discover on the walls of the cave uh, some scratchings that look like inscriptions. And at first you think, oh, it might have been, you know, leaching or erosion or something. But then you find more of them and they've got little pictograms of animals. And as you begin to study them carefully, as the archaeologist did with the Rosetta Stone, you begin to uh, correlate the, the uh, pictograms and the inscriptions. You realize this, this is actually a form of linguistic communi communication. Now you have, to asset, you have to readjust your assumption that there was no life, there was no intelligent life prior to um, the discovery of this cave on Antarctica because you found a distinctive hallmark of intelligent activity. When there's one and only one known cause for a given effect, you can reason re uh, retrodictively from the effect back to the cause, even if you didn't know that the cause was present prior to the time where you're investigating. And so uh, I think that that means that we need to be open to the possibility of intelligence, even if we don't know there was an intelligence present prior to the origin of life on Earth, for example. Because there could be distinctive yeah, because there could be distinctive indicators of intelligent activity um, from a time or from a place or from a domain that is uh, th that we were not previously able to verify. So the the, the mind would have would be something like our mind, but but smarter, bigger, more powerful, or whatever. Quite possibly, we're finding, for example, I mean, one of the predictions of an ID model is that we would find sophisticated design patterns uh, using the term of art from computer science in living cells. A design pattern in computer science is uh, a known method of storing tra or transmitting or processing information. I've had, we have a Microsoft uh, elite level architect program who's helped us write 10,000 lines of code to simulate the gene expression system in the DNA. He told me, it's full of, of computer design patterns that we recognize, only they're operating at an 8.0, 9.0, 10.0 efficiency beyond any, they're far more elegant than, than the design, uh, the, the similar design patterns that we've used. Um, that suggests maybe there is, the mind is, is superior to us. Yeah. You go back to your example of the, the cave in Antarctica. Let's say that cave was, yeah. was dated, I don't know, 10 million years ago. Well, this would be quite the find. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, there are some people who think that, you know, humans existed, you know, advanced civilizations long before ours, but this would be way, way before. But I, I don't think anybody would posit a supernatural agency. They would just say, wow, I guess our well, archaeology is completely of, that wrong. That wasn't the point of that illustration. It was just the, the idea that you would posit an intelligence from a time and a place that preceded known human intelligence to that point in your in your knowledge. The people that are searching for extraterrestrial intelligence do not know that ET is out there, but if they find the prime number sequence embedded in a radio signal or something even more sophisticated by way of information content, they're going to infer that an intelligence existed in a dom in, in a in a place and at from a time before which uh, previously from a t you know from a time and place that previously we didn't think there was any intelligence. Uh, if we discover fine tuning. At the, at the foundation of physical laws and in the initial conditions of the universe, by the same logic, it's completely uh, reasonable to think that there might have been an intelligence acting before the beginning of the universe on the entire universe. So I think we have to decide the I'm, nature. I'm following. I'm the, following the, you whether there. Whether or not we have intelligence and the nature of intelligence by the nature of the effect that we find. Yeah, I'm, I'm following the, the sequence. But um, again, if if we discover some carvings in the rock or something like this. We, we know how intelligent minds have done this in the past. They use stone tools or they use copper chisels or whatever. Um, but but so, so my next question would then be, 
where is this mind uh, in the universe or outside of it? And more importantly, how would it create the signal that somehow is obviously different than just using stone tools or copper tools or whatever? Um, how does the mind interact with the, the stuff? So this gets to one, one more point. The, you know the, the mind body problem you know how does the thought interact with exactly the, yep. the, the physical substance uh, in another area i like to, to, to tell my ghost hunting friends how does the ghost know to go right at the hallway and knock the painting off the wall it, it's supposedly this non-material stuff how does it interact with the stuff right right okay you see where i'm going with that well uh, yeah i do uh, uh... The methods of design detections, uh, detection that intelligent design proponents use allow us to rec retrodict to the activity of mind without answering the question of how minds affect the material world around us. People may say, well, that's a terrible cop-out. You haven't answered the question going in the forward direction of time. How does mind affect matter? But we don't actually know that with our own minds. And this is the mind-body problem. And as Gould used to point out, concerning evolutionary biology. He said we can often know um, uh, that something happened without exactly knowing how, how, how the cause, uh, uh, what, what caused it. So we can infer the activity of intelligence without knowing exactly how intelligence affects matter. You and I are, are, are constraining possibility spe uh, space right now as we you know, consider a nearly infinite a range and combination. I'm sorry, I've got another someone else trying to call me. I'll just turn them off here. I have one um, too. All right. Yeah, sorry. The, the perils of, of being in Zoom and Skype touch with the whole world, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oops. So so anyway, we, we're our, our, where was I? Yeah. So the idea is that um, we're making a limited claim here. We can infer the activity of mind. We're not saying we've solved the mind body problem, either, either for the way the human mind affects the matter around it or for the way in which the designing mind responsible for the fine tuning or the origin of life affected matter in the physical universe, the mind of God, if you will. But, but I am curious. In other words, to, we don't know. Just, we, you, we don't have a way of fair, answering fair that enough. question. Fair that, enough. That's okay. I don't know is always a good answer. <laughs> um, but I am curious, to, I mean, what are your, what's your sense or what's your hunch? Like, if you think that that mind intervened periodically, say in the Precambrian or the Precambrian or creation from RNA to DNA or bacteria flagellum or the blood clotting sequence or whatever example you want to use. Prokaryotes uh, to eukaryotes, one of my favorite, uh, I mean, this so, just so, unbelievable so does the intelligence, place. So yeah. does the intelligence create a universe with laws of nature that grind along and create complex forms like ice crystals or you know something like that, and you presume that he doesn't reach in uh, to do that, but periodically needs a little boost, like, well, we have prokaryote cells, I'm going to reach in there and, and glom them together into eukaryote cells. So that was an intervention there. So two things, you know, uh, 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 you're claiming that it's not constant. In other words, it's not like God intervenes in a deistic way. The whole running universe and all the laws, that's God. You don't mean in, in a deistic way or pantheistic way that way, right? No, I have a, I have a, a theistic... Um... And I think probably a biblical theology of nature in addition to the arguments that I'm making from nature to God. So that would be the difference between natural theology and theology of nature. Uh, and there's an ancient uh, theological distinction in, the, the, in both Jewish and Christian theology between what the Christian medieval theologians called the potentia ordinata, the ordinary power of God, which we see manifested in the ongoing and regular concourse of nature, which we dubbed in that period of time, the laws of nature, the laws being, after all, a juridical metaphor of theological origin, to quote one historian of science. Our whole notion of law, the law-like nature of nature is a theological concept that helped give rise to modern science. But in addition to that, uh, from a, a, a many theists have held that there is another power of God, which is sometimes called the potentia absoluta, or the fiat power of God, the, uh, the ability of God to act as an agent within the creation that he otherwise sustains and upholds, to act discreetly. And I, I think that since we can detect the activity of intelligence, and I've made an argument that the kind of intelligence that we're dealing with is neither deistic nor, uh, nor, nor alien, um, but rather uh, that when we look at the ensemble of evidences that I address in the book, that we have evidence for 
uh, the activity of God at the beginning of the universe and down the timeline as well. Um, insofar as we're dealing with that kind of intelligence, I think it's perfectly reasonable to think that God may have acted more than one time in that discrete way, even as he upholds the laws of nature on an ongoing basis. Uh, discrete infusions of information into the biosphere uh, suggest to me intelligence, uh, whereas I don't think, for example, mutation and selection does a good job of explaining how in, how uh, large infusions of information arose. I think mutation does a great job of explaining how minor modifications might have arisen, or gen more generally, how information is degraded. But I don't think it's a good explanation for the origin of information. Take something like embryology. So, and and from and one one just one other thing. This is about sensibilities. You know, you said glommed onto, and we use the word intervene, and that's kind of a so if you're operating out of a, a naturalistic or materialistic framework or worldview, the notion of God acting discreetly is often caricatured as an uh, an intervention to fix something that was broken, like you know it was a watch and then it broke and then we, it, but it might be more like uh, a great composer who's adding a new variation on a theme, and we don't think of of human action in sequence is somehow beneath our dignity. So I, I don't see oh, that it would be no, beneath I don't, God's dignity. I, I don't think that. Nor is it inherently disreputable to think of God. Yeah, no, no, I don't. If you accept the existence of God in the first place, and I think there's good reasons to do that. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't need to go that direction because I was going to bring up embryology. If you just look at the embryological development of a human fetus, I mean, the word miraculous is often used, and for good reason. It is just amazing that this cell knows it's to become stunning. a kidney stunning. cell, this one's yeah. a heart cell, that one's the toenail. How does it do this? I mean, and as you know, this is a you know big debate in embryological circles. Okay, is it your sense that God designed the embryological system of development from DNA at the beginning and it unfolds naturally, or does does the intelligent designer need to intervene at each cellular division to push it? Okay, that cell goes this way and that cell goes that way, and the stem cell is going to become that the cell and so on. Because if if, if it's the no. former, then why can't the whole universe just be wound up from the beginning? And that's what God did. He designed these laws to unfold in, in adaptive, complex ways and so on and, and end up with a, the complexity we have. Yeah, well, let, let's say for the sake of argument, I entirely accept that uh, that all the information in a fertilized egg is is present to unfold without any uh, subsequent inter intervention. I know some scientists who are so blown away by what's going on in embryology and by the uh, who have made informational calculations that wonder if there might be inputs along the way. I don't hold that view, but I'm not necessarily precluding it. I mean, it is an amazing. Our friend Paul Nelson, whom you know, uses the marching band analogy. You know that all the cells know where to you know where where to go and how to uh, 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 differentiate one from another, and it, it's it's stunning. It really is an amazing process, and there must be an enor an amazing amount of information in that. In that fertilized egg, and it's not all in the DNA. That's a that's a crucial thing that I, I draw out in Darwin's doubt. You have these hierarchies of of information in uh, the distribution of cell membranes, and the cytoskeletal arrays, in uh, the 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 sugar code, the intercellular signal signaling. I mean, it's it's re it's it's a fant fascinating subject. So, is it your but sense that let's the say it's all there? Yeah, let's say it's all there in the embryo, and it's just un un unfolding. You said, why couldn't it have been that? I have no, I have no in principle argument about why God couldn't have front end loaded everything. But what I have is a very extensive empirical evidence uh, argument in chapter fifteen of the book about why it looks extremely unlikely that that's what happened. Um, you, if you look at the structure of the DNA molecule, and if and we, we, it's very hard to sy to synthesize nucleotide bases under under realistic conditions without investigator interference. But let's give you a prebiotic soup with sugars, phosphates, and bases. And let then let's say, let's let the, the self-organizational -organiza chemical interactions between those molecules do their thing. You do not get an information-rich DNA molecule. You can look, you can examine the DNA structure, the, the structural formula for a DNA molecule. And you'll notice that there are no chemical bonds along the axis that contains the information between the individual nucleotide bases, and that the bases attach to the backbone with the exact same kind of bond in each case. So there's no chemical biasing as to why one base attaches in one part of the molecule as to another. So there's no underlying chemistry that explains the sequential arrangement of the bases, which is the informational uh, 
property of the molecule. Now, if 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 so, what's the argument? The argument is that if the DNA molecule in its if in if the highly relevant biologically subunits of information carrying molecules do not have inherent self organizing tendencies that would explain the origin of the information that DNA contains, then surely we do not have in the elementary particles or in the plasma right after the Big Bang uh, the information necessary to build a DNA molecule. If it's not in the if it's not in the biologically relevant subunits, it's not in the it's not in the uh, in the elementary particles. Or, or, or the plasma, and to, and to try to even conceive of a molecule that we don't even get atoms till 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So um, the front end loaded idea of design, I don't, I just don't think works. Well, then your sense would be that the mind then reaches in to stir the particles in some way to say bring those proteins together or create these hydrogen yeah, atoms reach or something in, like minds that. Affect, yeah, I think mind affected matter, and I think we see the evidence of that without knowing how. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then the question is, could that all be part of just the laws of nature? Here, let me channel Scalia and Rehnquist in uh, the Louisiana creationism trial that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. This is from my chapter in uh, Why People Believe Weird Things on this, because it was an interesting case in which the ACLU lawyers argued against the creationists that um, that these people are just teaching, they're sneaking religion in to their the classroom. And Rehnquist then says to the ACLU lawyer, Jay Topkis, my next question is going to be whether you considered Aristotelianism a religion. And Topkis says, of course not. Rehnquist says, well, then you could believe in a first cause, an unmoved mover that may be impersonal and has no obligation or of obedience or veneration from men, and in fact doesn't care what's happening to mankind. Topkis says, right. And Rehnquist says, and believe in creation. Topka says, not when creation means creation by a divine creator. And Rehnquist says, and I ask you again, it depends on what you mean by divine. If all you mean is a first cause, an, impos- an impersonal mover, and Topka says, divine, your honor, has connotations beyond I respectfully submit. And Rehnquist says, but the statue doesn't say divine. Topka says, no. Rehnquist, all it says is creation. You know, so in other words, Rehnquist is arguing, well, what would be wrong with teaching an Aristotelian the laws of nature have teleology built into them, and that's the creating force. That's still a, a materialistic, you know, kind of naturalistic take on creation, but sl- still slightly different than what evolutionists are arguing, and I think different from what you're arguing. Well, let's set aside the whole, you know, church-state jurisprudence issue. That's a, it's another whole can of worms. So we'll go off on another tangent there, Michael. But uh, uh, the laws of nature, by definition, describe regularities, patterns uh, that repeat, sun up, sun down, all unsuspended bodies dro- uh, fall. I drop the ball, I let go of the ball, it drops. Um, and they are, um, by definition, they describe what are in, in the information, what, what in the information sciences uh, uh, is described as redundancy, a repetitive order. The, the thing that we need to explain in the origin of life is not repetitive order, but rather aperiodic specificity, also known as specified complexity, uh, the term that Leslie Orgel first applied to the DNA in origin of life studies. Um, in other words, information. Information is not reducible to computational algorithm or to simple law-like descriptions that can be expressed as, for example, differential equations. And uh, the fine-tuning is subject to the same problem. So I think that that the laws of nature do a good job of describing regularities, self-organizational models of the origin of life do a good job of explaining what doesn't need to be explained. What needs to be explained in life is not simple order in the sense of redundancy or repetition or regularity, but rather aperiodic specificity, what we mean by specified or functional information. And that, in our experience, is precisely what always arises from an intelligent source. So I don't think, I, I, I don't think a... Uh, Positing laws alone will do. In fact, even in physics, and this is a great point that Michael Polanyi made, that that the laws of physics are, he said, are dumb without the gift of boundary constraints. We have to, laws describe certain regularities, but to describe the universe in its specificity, we need what are sometimes also called free parameters. We have to specify initial conditions. We have to specify the strength of uh, the force constants in the, in the fundamental physical laws. And we need to say something about 
And we, and we did information about the boundaries of the system that we're describing, what are called boundary constraints. All of that kind of information all, always comes from measurement and observation. So there's a kind of mythology in physics that laws explain everything. Rather, they describe regularities, and we don't even we can't even use them to generate specific predictions unless we also have information about initial and boundary conditions. So um, I don't think positing law alone will, will explain the universe in all its glorious specificity and information-rich content. Here, here's what I wrote in Why Darwin Matters. By the way, my only book with full frontal nudity on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that book. That was like 09, I think, right? Uh, yeah, 06, yeah. Uh, the ultimate answer okay. to the design inference is to provide a co cogent theory of natural design that account for the complexity of the universe and life. This we have through the sciences of complexity, in which we recognize the properties of self-organization and emergence that arise out of complex adaptive systems. Self-organization means that the system requires only an input of energy into it in order to generate an action which comes from within the system itself. An emergent property is one that is more than the sum of its parts. Complex adaptive systems are those that grow and learn as they change, and they are autocatalytic, which means that they contain self-driving feedback loops. So that would account for your bump in complexity or whatever without an outside source. I use several examples, language, consciousness, water, the law, the economy. I mean, no, no one designs an economy. Michael, the only, the only thing regulators the can... Language and consciousness, well, let me just, but, but let's just use the... A prize on you right away. I mean... Well, uh, use the, use the, the economy as an... Legit, you, let, let's use the economy as an example. Let's use the economy as an example. No one designed it. The only thing governments can do is regulate it and put restrictions on it and tax it and so on. But just you and I trading and so on, uh, out of that emerges this incredible complex system without any outside input. It's just, you know, individual persons doing exchanging. Isn't that something like Making what... Making free choices intelligently guided, though. This is not, this is not an, an analogy that's apt for describing how um, basic physical laws will generate information-rich molecules. And I have, I, you know, I really go into considerable depth in all three of the, the books I've written, Signature in the Cell, Darwin's Doubt, and the new one on the problem associated with self-organizational models of the origin of life. And, uh, and even self-organizational models of the origin of body plants, they only get anywhere if there's large inputs of unexplained pre-existing information. The kind of processes that are uh, cited as examples of dissipative, non-equilibrium self-organizational systems are things like tornadoes, draining bathtubs where there's where energy is moving through a system, but it produces a simple form of symmetric order. It doesn't produce the aperiodic complexity that you find in, in biological systems. I used to have an illustration of this that I used with students, uh, two big uh, Coke bottles filled with uh, uh, liquid with blue dye in it and sparkles. And if I put energy through the system in a Prigogine or Stuart Kaufman-like way, I would get a non-equilibrium system I would get order arising as a result of that, that energy input. It'd be a nice, beautiful spiral vortex. Fair enough. But those little sparkles did not line up and say, Steve Meyer did this. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the higher level order was the result. You still had lower, lower level randomness. Uh, and the, the, there's just some very powerful critiques now of these self-organizational models uh, Brian Miller, a PhD in complex systems physics from Duke, who's now uh, our, one of our research coordinators here at Discovery, wrote an excellent article at, the, uh, at Inference, the, uh, the journal that David Berlinski edits in response to Jeremy England on this whole question, these newer models of self-organization based on what are called dissipation theorems. And they, they really don't work in explaining the origin of life because they need information, even dissipative systems, to get anything that's remotely complex have to have an equivalent amount of informational input at the beginning. And most processes that we know are producing order spontaneously with simple energy moving through the system are giving a simple form of redundant order, not specify complexity. So I, I just don't think that's a, I don't think that's a very compelling alternative explanation of the origin of life. Okay. Um, let's go back to how the mind could operate within the physical universe here. I'm, uh, I'm going to quote Sean Carroll from one of my, Scientific American columns that if we follow this uh, trend that I was talking about, what place is there for such paranormal forces as ESP or supernatural agents like God? 
Do we know enough to know that they cannot exist? Or is it possible that there are unknown forces within our universe or intentional agents outside of it that we have yet to discover? According to Caltech physicist Sean Carroll in his book, The Big Picture, quote, all of the things you've ever seen or experienced in your life, objects, plants, animals, people, are all made of a small number of particles interacting with one another through a small number of forces. Close quote. Once you understand the fundamental forces of nature, such as the thermodynamic arrow of time and the core theory of particle and forces, you can scale up to planets and people and even assess the likelihood that God, the soul, the afterlife, and ESP exist, which Carol concludes is very low. But is Let, that, let's talk about scaling up. Yeah, okay. You used that phrase a minute okay. ago, too. Okay, yep. yeah, that's okay. the crucial thing in all these ideas about emergence. Um, Michael Polanyi wrote two really profound articles in the late 1960s, one called Life Transcending Physics and Chemistry, and another called Life's Irreducible Complexity, or uh, Life's Irreducible Structure. Behe was the irreducible complexity guy later. Um, and one of the, one of the points that uh, Polanyi makes is that at each level in what we would call a hierarchy, where if you were an emergentist, you'd say that you had scaled up, that the possibility space uh, of the lower level has been significantly and often incredibly tightly constrained. The basic law, the fundamental four laws of forces allow for a vast ensemble of possible events. Uh, and therefore, they, for example, the law of gravity allows um, uh, apples to fall, and astronauts to fly to the moon. But the law is operative in both, in both situations. What accounts for the difference is not the law. The law isn't the difference that makes a difference. What makes a difference is the constraint on the arrangements of matter that allowed engineers to produce something like the Saturn V rocket. And yes, they implemented uh, knowledge of other laws, laws of chemistry, laws of propulsion. But at every point in that uh, ensemble of possibilities, constraints have to be applied to get the specificity, in this case of engineering, that allows a completely different event to occur than one, that one you normally expect, which is that objects fall. And so the underlying laws at every level are not what's responsible for scaling up. What's always involved in scaling up is constraints on possibility space, boundary constraints, and that involves an input of information. Because whenever you're saying, we're gonna go, we, we, we want A, not B, zero, not one, this, constraint, not that constraint, we're imparting information. So um, scaling up requires emergence, requires information inputs. And my argument is that, again, that information is the product of mind. It comes from, in our experience, it's, it's minds that constrain possibility space to achieve functional outcomes. That is to say, it's minds that generate information. So I, I, I always find these, the emergentist um, account of things really lacking in specificity. It seems like a, a slogan without real, that doesn't really address the underlying problem, which is what constrains possibility space at each one of these hierarchical levels that um, uh, allegedly emerge from the lower level. Yeah. Well, so uh, again, how does the mind do this? Uh, which forces is it using? Carol's point here, uh, say, continuing with quotes from him, take the core theory of particles and forces, which Carroll says is indisputably accurate within a very wide domain of applicability, such that a thousand or a million years from now, whatever amazing discovery science will have made, our descendants are not going to be saying, ha ha, those silly 21st century scientists believing in neutrons and electromagnetism. Uh, thus, Carroll concludes that the laws of physics rule out the possibility of true psychic powers. Why? Because the particles and forces of nature don't allow us to bend spoons, levitate, or read minds, and we know that there aren't new particles or forces out there yet to be discovered that would support them. Not simply because we haven't found them yet, but because we definitely would have found them if they had the right characteristics to give us the requisite powers. And then he goes on to talk about God in the same way. Leave out ESP. Just right, right, does, right. I, yeah. I get, what he's, I get yeah. what he's doing there. But here, here's the thing. We, we have observations from our direct introspective experience about what minds can do. We also know what our human minds can't do. We have we have knowledge of their limitation. So um, I'm with you. I've never been uh, when, when you when you're skeptical about the spoon benders. I say <laughs> go, Michael. You know, you get them. Um, so, uh, but one of the things that minds do, and we can 
cash this out in abstract conspe- conceptually, is that minds constrain degrees of mathematical freedom. They constrain possibility space. You and I are doing it as we're using language. We have a nearly infinite array of possible sounds and symbols that we could babble back and forth at each other. But on, a, on an ongoing moment-by-moment basis, we are carefully choosing sounds and symbols, words and syntax, semantics, in order to convey our meaning one to another. And amazingly, we're able to do it. Now, so we know minds have that power, and that, and it's precisely that's power that's necessary to constrain the possibility space that gets you from physics to chemistry, chemistry to biology, and especially uh, to actual living cells. I mean, uh, to, and to the information that's needed to produce living cells. So uh, we don't know how minds do that, but we are on a, on a, in a real time uh, experiment. You and I right now using our minds to do that. We know minds have that capability. And we're looking at features in life that require that capability. And I've unpacked that argument more in the books. I think digital code, hierarchically organized information, a tightly integrated information storage, transmission and processing systems are solely in our experience, the, pro- the product of intelligence. And when we find those at the foundation of life and even the simplest living cells, this is not an irrational leap to, to conclude that a mind played a role in the origin of those systems as well. Yeah. Um, you're, I think you're familiar with my little thought experiment, what I call Schirmer's last law, any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial (laughs) intelligence would be indistinguishable from God. And I would just expand that to say far future humans or, uh, or anything like that. I mean, just take, take a look at this from just, it says 2007. I mean, this is uh, another miracle, right? So, well, no, no one infers. No, no one believes that the iPhone arose without Steve Jobs, right? So, <laughs> right. Uh, but but so let's know, say we we've we, got a strong it, basis. Yeah. If if we discovered ETIs, um, it, it, as Sagan always said, they're not going to be like just five years ahead of us or behind us. They're going to be like five million years ahead of us, and we're not they're not going to be behind us if we encounter their technological signals or whatever. So you know, just look what we've accomplished in say the last century of science and techno- technology. If you made that a hundred thousand years of history or a million years of history. You know, anything that, that we can imagine a god could do, they could surely do. It's just engineering and technology and knowledge, right? Uh, and so could it be that the mind is, and also Michio Kaku talks about this, that whatever the aliens are going to be like, they're probably not going to be physical beings anymore. They're probably going to be just minds in computers or something like a cloud, uh, you know, beaming around the universe on 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 laser beams or something. The universe is computation hypothesis, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. an ID hypothesis. Yeah, guess, yeah, right. yeah. Okay, so that's right. So could it be a super advanced intelligence, not a personal god in the Christian traditional sense, but just some kind of higher intelligence like that? Yeah, excellent. But you do a great job of marketing your ideas too. With the those are memorable. I mean, I'm not not. <laughs> I'm not as good as Dawkins. I, I need to work on that. What'd you call it? Shermer's, uh, Shermer's last law, because I don't believe in naming laws after Shermer's yourself. Shermer's last law. <laughs> I need a first law and a last law. <laughs> yeah. Newton had three. He got three laws, and he right. became pretty well, of course, famous I stole from it from, from, anyway, from, sorry uh, about that. I stole it from okay, Clark, yeah, well, who stole it from Newton. Did you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, so um, I actually addressed that hypothesis. Uh, it's uh, Whether you call it scientific or metaphysical, I don't know. Don't really. I never really care about those classifications uh, when we're dealing with these ultimate issues. Um, but the panspermia hypothesis is effectively that. It's the idea that a, a, a very advanced intelligence um, that evolved by undirected, strictly materialistic processes uh, got so advanced that it could figure out how to create other forms of life and seed them here on planet Earth. And uh, no less a personage than the great Francis Crick uh, actually floated this idea in his book, Life Itself, uh, which was a little book on the difficulty of the origin of life problem. Um, Dawkins, uh, perhaps, uh, now he, I think he regrets this, but he, he floated the idea at the end of a, of an interview with Ben Stein in the film Expelled, when he acknowledged, yeah, there might be a signature of intelligence in the cell, but it would have had to have come from some other intelligent being somewhere out in the cosmos that also evolved by undirected material processes. In the book, I argue, I, I take that hypothesis on as a competing hypothesis to the theistic God hypothesis. And I argue that it has two deficiencies with respect to the ensemble of evidence that I'm examining or the, uh, um, about biological and cosmological origin, origins. One, it doesn't really solve the problem of the origin of life, because to get the evolutionary process going, 
we know we now know that anything worthy of being called life requires a large input of information to again constrain the arrangements of matter to produce something that is self-replicating and uh, has metabolism in an enclosure and so forth. So to get anything worthy of being called life going, you have to have an input of information. And that has proved to be incredibly difficult from the standpoint of underlying chemistry, including self-organizational processes. So pushing the problem out into space someplace doesn't actually solve it. Problem number one. But the deeper problem is that no being within the cosmos can account for the origin of the fine-tuning from the very beginning of the universe upon which its own evolution would subsequently depend, nor can such a, 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 a uber intelligence within the cosmos account for the origin of the universe itself. So when you look at the ensemble of evidence we have about biological and cosmological origins, not only the evidence of design in the information bearing properties of DNA, RNA, et cetera, but also the evidence of design that we have in the fine tuning and in the, and in the, and, and the, the, the evidence of a discrete beginning to the universe itself, I think that theistic design provides a better overall explanation of that ensemble than a space alien, however uh, omniscient uh, it might have evolved to be. And that would be your same answer to the re rebuttal, this is the way I put it, if the world is complex and looks intricately designed, therefore, and therefore the best inference is that there must be an intelligent designer by the same logic we should infer that an intelligent designer must itself have been designed by a superior intelligent designer, and then a super duper superior intelligent designer designed yeah, that the, one. The, so, these are these are logic chopping games that a lot of the. I mean, I really, you know, I don't know if you're quoting Carol because I really, I no, really that was, respect Carol. I think the, he's a, that's just reflecting a bunch. I think guy. Dawkins made that argument too. A bunch of people have. Yeah, that's Dawkins who who designed the designer objection. I addressed that in chapter 17 of the signature in the cell in signature in the cell in a really considerable detail. Short answer is every system of thought, every every worldview or uh, metaphysical system posits something as the thing from which everything else comes. Dawkins clearly posits matter and energy and in the in the living context, uh, uh, a, a self-replicating system of molecules. You can ask Dawkins, you know, well, what what you know who what what produced the replicator and what produced the the matter and energy? His answer and that of consistent philosophical materialists has always been matter and energy, space and time are eternal and self-existent. They play the same role in our system of thought that God plays in a theistic system of thought. So the real question is not what came before that philosophical primitive, because every system of thought has that problem. The question is, what is a better candidate to be that philosophical primitive, the prime reality from which everything else comes? I think the indicators we have of the, of the finitude of the universe, that the universe had a beginning, and that the properties of the universe that are pointing to mind suggest that mind is a better is a better ultimate explanatory principle than matter. I don't think matter scales up to mind. I do think minds shape matter. So would an analogy be this would be like trying to explain the origins of baseball, since you mentioned baseball in your book, and I love that section because I was a big uh, Cincinnati <laughs> Reds fan. The, the, the big red machine with Johnny Bench, Pete Rose. Well, those, and so, that was Johnny yeah. Bench, <laughs> yeah. Morgan. That was, those yeah. were the days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it would be like trying to explain the origins of baseball based on the rules that the game itself is played. You can't do that. This is a separate kind of explanatory uh, mechanism. Right. Yeah. Exactly. What? 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 Who set up the rules? The the rules describe how the game is played, but there was there was a person. I you know, uh, forgetting who who. Did. Naismith was to basketball what someone was to, to baseball, and I'm forgetting the. Uh, it wasn't Doubleday. The, I guess the, the legend was Doubleday, yeah, Double Day, but it's, but it's, it turns out it's yeah. Different. More, more complex, complex than history that. with baseball, but 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 would that would that not then apply to your using the concept of mind itself, since mind is part of the physical universe? However, it it arises out of out of neurons firing. Um, you're applying that to outside of the system. Well, the uh, the great philosopher of mind, John Searle, uh, gave a wonderful talk at that Baylor conference that you and I attended, where he showed that every single physicalist or even functionalist account of the origin of mind was able to cite, um, well, what he called them neurophysiological uh, correlates, necessary conditions of the function of the mind. But in every case, he showed that there was a gap between necessity and sufficiency in the causal sense, that, that our physiological, the physiological substrate, what's going on chemically in our, in our brains and the way synapses, synapses are firing, those are, those are absolutely necessary to proper function. 
But there's a difference between that and what our minds do when we are reasoning. And that that gap is non-physical. Uh, my experience of red, or seeing you sometimes very clearly in, in Skype and then sometimes a little bit blurry because the, the probably the bandwidth issue, my experience of that, my conscious awareness of you is is fundamentally a different thing than whatever the physiological substrate is that makes that possible. And so, uh, and my reasoning based on that, that imagery and the sounds and symbols that we're transmitting is something that is qualitatively different than, than the, uh, the, the, uh, the physiological processes that make my brain function possible. So I, I'm a mind-body dualist. I'm not a simplistic Cartesian dualist. I'm a mind-body, I, I like the, the Eccles, um, uh, popper idea. Of Are mind you sure body you're not a mind monist in which God is the mind and all of it derives from that one single source? No, I I know I know people who are Berkeley and idealists who trend that way, but I think physical properties. I, and this is my when I referred earlier to a biblical theology of nature. I think the physical world, physical entities have real causal powers. That's why I think it's completely legitimate to for in. You know, vast swaths of scientific inquiry are concerned with how does one part of nature affect each other? Nature has real causal powers. But I also think that there is evidence in the structure of nature that mind played a role in its origin. And so I, I, th I believe both things are real, mind and body, mind and matter. My friend Deepak Chopra is a, a, a mind monist in, in the sense that you use Tillich's sense. description. Is Eastern world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You use Tillich's uh, phrase, the you know the ground of all being, which Deepak uses for consciousness. He says, Consci "There's nothing beneath consciousness. That is the ground of all being." And what you call you, Stephen Meyer, call God. I call consciousness. There's no conflict. We're talking about the same thing. You speaking as as, as uh, Deepak Chopra yeah. or yourself? Yeah. No, Deepak. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. No, I mean these are the great philosophical questions. There's, you know, there's basically, and I, I laid this out in the book. There's, there's, there's three basic, uh, you know, classic worldviews. There's the uh, mind before matter, uh, roughly theism, deism. There's the matter before mind, which is the materialism view, and then there's the mind and matter are essentially one and the same, the pantheistic or uh, panpsychic view, of, mainly of, that comes out of the East. So. Uh, you know, as someone who's teach philosophy, philosophy of science, this is, you know, this is a great discussion. I know, it's a big it's one. It's a great conversation. Right? All right, let's, three, let, let's, go to, let's go to another huge Let's go to another huge one. Let's go to another huge one, nothingness. <laughs> so in, in, uh, in my book, Giving the Devil's Due, it's just an essay collection. So I, uh, I wrote an expanded version of my short um, article in Scientific American about n nothing. Um, so first of all, I, I mean, it's just such a weird concept. So here I'm quoting... Uh, Robert Kuhn, he wrote a book with John Leslie called The Mystery of Existence. Why is there anything at all? So first, it's impossible to conceptualize nothing, no space, time, matter, light, darkness, or even conscious beings to perceive the nothingness. Here's Kuhn. Not just emptiness, not just blankness, and not just emptiness and blankness forever, but not even the existence of emptiness, and not even the meaning of blankness, and no forever. You know, at this point, I don't even know what I'm talking about. I mean, this is just, you know, it's just like, what? <laughs> Am I stoned? Around. Right. You know, and, and, yeah. and so here, I feel, sometimes I feel like you we're You might hitting... be able to get your synapses around it, but you're not getting your mind around it. Yeah, I'm not sure it's possible. And so we're, yeah. I think, you know, we well, maybe if we had bigger brains or something, I don't know. But we're hitting an epistemological well, wall. Here, here's something that I, I would love to commend to you at, at Skeptic Magazine as a, you know, a, a topic to address. There's been this big push, you know, um, and we alluded to this earlier, the idea that, well, you know, in making a cosmological argument of the kind that I make, mine is mine has a different form than the, the deductive argument of William and Craig. I use an inference to the best explanation sort of structure. People will come back and say, well, but do we absolutely know that the universe had an absolute beginning? We can't back extrapolate all the way because we've got General, you know, general relativity only takes us back within Planck time, um, and I say fair enough. Uh, there are also arguments for an absolute beginning based on special relativity that are geometric, that don't have energy conditions and don't depend on knowing what gravity was like in a quantum uh, domain. 
Uh, but uh, so I think you can really justify the idea that there was a beginning. There's a physical extremity past which you can't go. But let's say you don't you don't go with me that far. We have lots of indicators at the beginning, at least. Uh, the alternative approach to this is to say, yeah, we're going to we're going to try to characterize the beginning of the universe using uh, uh, some sort of quantum gravitational ideas. And uh, so we'll come up with a quantum theory, a, a quantum gravity, a quantum cosmology. And the advocates of that, and this connects to your, your, the quotation you just read, people like Lawrence Krauss, who's popularized the work of Alexander Vilenkin or the Hawking Heart model, have, have essentially argued that we can explain the universe from nothing, uh, nothing except the laws of physics, uh, the laws of physics that apply to the quantum gravitational um, era or epoch. Okay. Um, but in the book, and this is, I think, one of the most significant original arguments in my new book, uh, I argue that if that model of cosmological origins is true, it has its own tacit theistic implications. Uh, if you have a definite beginning and you de develop a, a cosmological argument from that, you've got a God, you, you have a, a very strong God hypothesis. But if you don't like, if you just say, let's not go with a definite beginning, let's say maybe we don't get a definite beginning, let's use quantum cosmological approaches. We're going to explain, the, and this is Krauss's claim on the, on the cover of his book, Universe from Nothing. We've explained the origin from, from literally nothing, physical. But what ends up being the explanatory principle is what's called the universal wave function, the mathematical descriptions of all the possible universes that could emerge out of the singularity. So even in quantum cosmology, number one, there's still a singularity. There's still a beginning. It's presupposed in all the models. Whatever Hawking said in his popular books about imaginary time eliminating the singularity, it's still in his technical papers. I've read them, okay? Number two, the explanands, the thing doing the explaining of the origin of the universe, is a mathematical abstraction. It's a universal wave function, which is the solution to a big, hairy equation called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which is the analog to the classical Schrodinger equation in ordinary quantum mechanics. It's quite a trick to get a material universe of matter, space, time, and energy out of a pure mathematical expression. Are we really explaining the universe from nothing? Well. Here's what Vilenkin has said about this, who, whom Krauss is popularizing. He's got a fascinating rhetorical question he, he raises at the end of uh, uh, <clears throat> Many Universes in One. And he says, before there was matter, space, time, and energy, what template were these laws, physical laws of quantum gravity or whatever, what template were they being written on? Because the laws of physics are things that we use to describe matter, space, time, and energy. They, they describe how matter interacts. They don't tell us where the universe came from. So if we have a realm of pure mathematics, knowing that math is conceptual and always exists in a mind, he says, are we really saying that a mind predates the universe? And so I've argued in the new book that quantum cosmology, if true, is the alternative to the straightforward extrapolation back to an absolute beginning. If it is true, it has its own theistic implications because it implies mind before matter. And furthermore, and this is the even deeper thing, it turns out that to get that universal wave function, which functions as the explanatory principle in quantum cosmology, psi, you know, the famous uh, expression from quantum mechanics, applied to the early universe, that psi is a purely mathematical reality, but you only get a psi that includes our universe, which is a condition of explanation on this model. You only get such a psi function if you solve the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. But the Wheeler-DeWitt equation is a functional differential equation that has an infinite number of solutions unless very restrictive boundary constraints are applied to it. But there's no physical system yet. There's no physical universe to describe that you're describing. So there's nothing in the physics can, that can help you specify the boundary constraints. So where do they come from? They're chosen by the theoretical physicists with an end goal in mind, namely getting a psi function out that includes a universe like ours that matches our physics. So this is entirely teleologically, it's a modeling that's entirely teleological, and it requires an input of information from the theoretical physicist into the mathematical apparatus that models the origin of the universe. And that, that I, cont I contend, is a form of intelligent design. It's just like the simulation experiments that the original life researchers do, where you've got massive investigator interference. Would that be so different than, go, than Max Tegmark's idea of the mathematical universe, the whole thing at bottom, pure mathematics? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 
I, that's what I just described was chapter 18 in my book. What you just asked about is chapter 19. Perfect. <laughs> Ted Mark uh, takes the multi, yeah, takes the multiverse one better, and um, and says that every mathematically possible structure is instantiated in some possible world. Okay, and that would allow you to circumvent the argument I'm making now about the need for inputs of information because you just say that every possible solution to the wheeler dewitt equation was one of those mathematical structures that existed in some possible world. So that is the one way, that, that, is, the, that is the atheist way out of the cosmological argument, but it comes at a huge cost, Michael. And that is that if you accept that every mathematical structure that is possible exists in some possible world, you can have very idiosyncratic laws in which things are regular for a long period of time, and then something completely irregular occurs. Polanyi made the great observation that through any finite set of points, you can draw an infinite number of curves. So you can you could, you essentially end up with a complete. We could be living in a universe that has looked completely regular in its basic law-like structure till right now, and then we will have could have an episodic random quantum fluctuation, or just we might have laws that describe highly irregular curves and phenomena, cause and effect relationships. It completely destroys the possibility of reliable uh, prediction or explanation. Uh, you get Boltzmann brain problems. And so it, these infinite universe cosmologies, which are necessary to circumvent cosmological arguments, are possible ways of look, viewing things, but they come at the cost of the uh, a complete destruction in any reasonable confidence in the reliability of the mind. In other words, you can get rid of the God argument, but only at the cost of science. You can have, my argument is you can have, you, it, that science points to God, but you can circumvent the arguments from science to God, but only at the cost of destroying science. You end up with the epistemological chaos. And that's, I look at the, the you know, the Boltzmann brain problem, the, and, and the, the complete inability on a, on a Tegmarkian view of things to make uh, either to have reliable scientific explanation or prediction. This is getting heavy. Sometimes I feel like Marty McFly and Back to the Future. English doc. <laughs> <laughs> hey, All right. Hey, and I, I maybe, yeah, I, I maybe we should do one last thing because we've been at it an hour and forty-five. I might be wearing you out. And I was going to give uh, you one I've last, that, one last yeah, challenge yeah. here. This, this comes from uh, Leslie and Kuhn's book, The Mystery of Existence, and Kuhn's taxonomy of nothings. He lists what categories of things might be included in something that would be negated by nothing. These include physical, mental, platonic, spiritual, and God. Physical, all matter, energy, space, and time, and all the laws and principles that govern them, known and unknown. Mental, all kinds of consciousness and awareness, known and unknown. Platonic, all forms of abstract objects, numbers, logic, forms, propositions, possibilities, again, known and unknown. Spiritual and God, anything that could possibly fit this non-physical category, all forms of religious and spiritual belief. If by nothing is meant no physical objects or matter of any kind, for example, there could still be energy from which matter may arise by natural forces guided by the laws of nature. Physicists, for example, talk about empty space as seething with virtual particles from which particle-antiparticle pairs come into existence as a consequence of the uncertainty principle of quantum physics. Yeah, or scalar fields. Or, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But if by nothing but is that's meant... Not really, that's not really nothing in the philosophical That's right. Sense. But here, it's that's, a, that's to the, a something. To the point. Yeah. But if by nothing is meant also no physical, mental, platonic, or non-physical entity of any kind, then there can be no god or gods, which means there cannot be anything outside of nothing out of which to create something. So how does that square with your... You're making my head hurt too. But, <laughs> you know, um, well, I just, uh, you know, a, a kind of uh, cue to some of the the uh, considerations that I develop in the book here. Uh, the quantum cosmologists, at least in their popularizations, uh, will say that they've explained the universe from nothing. But their nothing is even is either pre-existing space with an energy field uh, that is unexplained, or it's uh, uh, if you push it back further. A quantum mechanical wave function, a universal wave function that that describes what they call superspace, all the possible universes with various gravitational fields, um, and then a mathematical apparatus that allows you to to justify the existence of of such a a, um, a mathematical entity. So in in quantum cosmology, it's not um, it's it's either 
pre-existing space with energy, which is not nothing, or it's pre-existing mathematical reality, which is platonic and I would argue theistic, because in our experience, ideas don't exist disembodied, they exist in minds. Minds think ideas. So if, we're, if, we're, if, we're, if they're really saying that the universe came out of math, then I think Valenkin is right in his... Uh, well, Valenkin never answered his own rhetorical question, but he raised a very provocative question, which is, are we really then saying that the, the universe came out of a mind? It seems to be implied in the idea that math precedes matter. And Hawking himself tumbled to this when he said, what puts fire in the equations that gives us a universe to describe? Hawking was the classic uh, God-obsessed atheist. And, 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 and I mean that as a compliment. He was taking these things very seriously and didn't want the God hypothesis to be true, but also was wrestling from the time he proved the singularity theorem to the end of his life in developing cosmological models that would, he hoped, make the God hypothesis unnecessary. I, I think ultimately he failed, but I uh, applaud the struggle. He was quite yeah, an interesting no, I, figure. I, I recommend you read uh, Leonard Mladenow's book, Stephen Hawking, a memoir. He, he talks about that, and I think this is going to be uh, one of these enduring conversations. You know, what did Einstein really say about God? What did Hawking really mean about God? So here's Leonard's day, because he knew yeah, yeah. he knew Hawking pretty well. They, you know, they wrote yeah, the I, grand they design together. together. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they wrote two books right. together. So any, anyway, in the epilogue, he opens with uh, Bantam published the grand design. Here it is. Um, in September 2010, uh, on the morning of September 2nd, I was walking my daughter Olivia to school when my cell phone rang. It was Judith, just Hawking's assistant there. Uh, and she was agitated. Leonard, she shouted, we need your help. I have no idea what she was talking about. Haven't you seen the Times, she asked. The New York Times, I said. Yes, I'd read it. No, not the New York Times, the London Times. Haven't you seen it? Judith, who reads the London Times here in L.A.? <laughs> well, Google it and look at the headline. It says, quote, Hawking, colon, God did not create the universe. It's creating a furor. Well, the press is all over, uh, and, and then Leonard continues, that's wrong. We said God isn't necessary for creating the universe. Not that physics proves he didn't. Well, the press is all over it, and Stephen can't handle it all. We need your help. <laughs> you know, so he, he ended up fending off all these things. No, we're not saying that. We're not saying we prove there's no God or anything like that. Just that it's not necessary. Well, I did find a disparity in uh, Hawking's between Hawking's popular work in the brief history of time. I was a wet behind the ears grad student and got to attend some of the lectures upon which that uh, popular book was, was based when I was in Cambridge. Um, and uh, uh, so I've been interested in this quantum cosmological stuff for a long time, um, but I have recently revisited it. And uh, you know, he, he claims that he does this mathematical transformation called a wick rotation on the a space a d depiction of space time mathematically and in an intermediate step in that depiction you you what they call spatialized time and time is a variable drops out as you're in the domain of complex numbers and so the depiction of the universe looks like it has no definite beginning but he acknowledges that that depiction has no physical significance but in that that famous statement that the british press and others of worldwide press jumped on you know um what need then for a creator you know, if there's no beginning, then what need then for a creator? Um, actually, you know, this was a kind of, uh, and he almost characterized it this way in his more honest moments, just saying that this was a kind of mathematical trick. That's what he said. It was a mathematical trick. It had no physical meaning. Therefore, you can't really draw a metaphysical implication from, from a mathematical expression that has no physical meaning. He acknowledged that when you transform back into the, the, the domain of real numbers, that the singularity re reappears. And it's presupposed in all his technical papers with Hartle on uh, on quantum cosmology. So, um, so I can understand the way the, you know the 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 misunderstanding arose. Uh, of course, my argument is that it's not just that the God hypothesis is not necessary. Um, I actually argue that quantum cosmology, Hawking's own research program here with Hartle, has tacit or latent implications that suggest the necessity of a God hypothesis, the explanatory necessity of a God hypothesis, uh, that, that, uh, that if, if you're actually having to constrain possibility space to get your mathematical apparatus to produce a universal wave function that includes a universe like ours, then you are actually modeling the need for an input of information 
in order to generate a universe like ours. And so therefore, even if you can get matter and energy out of math alone, you can't get the information needed to produce a universe like ours without mind. So um, I think I, you know, if quantum cosmology is true, it has implications that, that are theistic and every bit as powerfully theistic as a straightforward Kalam argument of the type that uh, William Lane Craig makes. Could be he was just being also a little playful because Leonard's got another story about uh, the sentence in the grand. I think it was in the grand design where they said something like philosophy is dead or philosophers have you know haven't done anything in in, in ages or, and and Leonard said Stephen we can't say that that's not true and uh, so then uh, Leonard says I brought in a bunch of philosophy of science books and started going through them and I wrote this like paragraph long sentence about the proper way to say it and Stephen said your sentence has no punch we're going with mine. It has no punch. Yeah. yeah. Well, then they wrote a popular book, and fair enough. You know, fair enough. Yeah. That's the. Uh, so it could be he's the, looking you know, for the, punchiness. The fun thing about Haw Hawking did have a twinkle about him. You know, yeah. and you could, yeah. you could, his he had a wit that came through even through the voice synth synthesizer. Um, so, uh, but I, I I think the what I did in in the new book is develop what philosophers call a robust argument, showing that if you depend, you can take several different things as the factual predicate and you'll end up in the same with the same conclusion so if you you assume that as best we can tell the universe had a beginning the best explanation of the beginning is something like a transcendent intelligence theism or deism um if you say well we can't be absolutely sure there was a beginning we need a quantum cosmological model of the origin of the universe then i show you have theistic implications for other reasons although even in those models they Still pre presuppose the singularity. So, um, and the only reason not to accept that there was a beginning was that we might have this very small era of time inside Planck time, uh, an epoch of quantum gravity. Uh, and so, if you run with quantum gravity, you end up with all the, the difficulties I just described of a universal way, a math, matter coming out of math, and the need for information to make the math describe a universe like ours, which is coming out of a mind in all the modeling. All right, Stephen, we're pushing up on two hours. Let me just close with this. It, 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 let me just yeah. close with this. If I'm right, we'll never know. If you're right, we will find out in the next life, and I'll get to I'll get to apologize. <laughs> and hopefully, we'll be in the same place. Well, no apologies will be needed. <laughs> we'll just have we'll sit down continue and continue the good, conversation. Good, <laughs> we'll have an infinitely long conversation. Right we'll, on. We'll ask the mind, yeah. why didn't you give us more evidence? No, just kidding. <laughs> All right, Stephen, we will continue the conversation when the next book comes out, probably on consciousness and morality or hey, something like that. Thank you for this, and congrats on your new book, which I understand is just come out? Or oh, no, no. Well, this, this was my essay uh, collections, which is a year now. A paperback comes out pretty soon, and then the next big book is on conspiracies. Conspiracies and conspiracy theories okay. is another uh, topic that has kind of risen to the top of the uh, news cycle. Yes, so, indeed. Yeah, indeed. I so. understand. All right. Congratulations again. All right. Uh, in you. fact, That's I forgot to endorse this at the beginning. Uh, deep conversation. The, the way I say it is, yeah. uh, if you want to read one single book that best summarizes intelligent design theory, this is it. You capture all the, the major arguments and, and, and all the latest stuff that's been uh, worked out in the last few decades. So good job. We'll see you next time. You, you too, friend. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll hope we connect in person before too long as things open up. <laughs>